Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Paul, and today I have Sarah Fort Bishop on the show for the first time. We discuss how she was involved with some bodybuilding research with Bill Campbell and her role as a health and physique coach and what she's found in terms of differences between males and females and much, much more. But before we dig into that, I just want to remind you that we have the London seminar running June 4th. We have tickets still available, so definitely jump on that. And we hope to see you there as we are hosting the guys from the team Full Rom. That's Charlie Zhang. We have Jared Feather. And of course, Mike Isratel. It's going to be an amazing time. So do not miss out on that. But without further ado, let's get into the show. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Sarah Ford Bishop on the podcast. Uh, some of you may have heard Sarah on her own podcast um, or seen her over on Instagram. That's where I'd found most of her content. But Sarah has an MS in exercise science. She was actually involved with quite a bit of bodybuilding research at Bill Campbell, who's been on the podcast before in his performance and physique enhancement lab, which must have been all sorts of fun. And uh, she's a health and physique coach herself and also a bikini competitor. So I thought obviously an ideal person to bring on the podcast and just there's never enough females uh, to interview and bring onto the show. And I love getting the female perspective on here. So thank you so much for taking the time, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Steve, for for having me on. It's funny. Revive Stronger was actually like one of the first podcasts I ever like listened to. Like when I first found out about podcasts, you know, however many years ago. So it's, it's really cool to be on. Yeah, it was. uh, I, I think that's how I came across yourself and your content because I think you may have shared one of the episodes sometime. It's like, oh, like Sarah looks like a really cool person to also like follow and interact with. So, which is great because I'm finding people and people are finding the show. And yeah, it's got to a point where, yeah, we've got had a lot of guests on and uh, it's great that then there's so many podcasts now available. I know you started, when did you start your own podcast up? Uh, I started mine at the beginning of 2021. So yeah, okay. beginning of last year. Yeah. Um, and then I actually have another one that I'm a co-host with, with some friends that ah. we started um, last year too. So yeah, I love it. I love the podcast. I like the longer form car- content. Yeah. I know if I started my original, like the original Revive Stronger podcast, if you listen to some of the first episodes, Sarah, I don't think it would catch on now. I think it would just die a horrible death because the quality <laughs> from the audio to like my internet connection, like <clears throat> it was terrible. Uh, you actually have like to have a successful podcast now you have to really put in a lot of effort and time which i think is a good thing like there's actual barriers to entry now but it's actually quite a simple like it's not as complicated like if people think podcasting is complicated it's it's quite simple actually yeah yeah it's the consistency exactly like you said the hard part yeah absolutely uh and then out of interest what uh with bill campbell what sort of stuff were you involved in at his lab was that part of your uh time at university or Yeah. So that was, so I went to the university of South Florida, both as an undergrad and as a grad student. And that was when I was in the master's in exercise science program with, with Dr. Campbell. And I was lucky to be involved with a lot of, you know, kind of more relevant research, um, to what we do. So diet breaks, uh, refeeds, uh, I helped a little bit with a glute hypertrophy study, uh, bodybuilding kind of case studies I, I helped out with. So that was like, you know, very cool, very niche. Um, and he's really growing that program over there. So that, I, I was in grad school 20, um, 2018, I'm sorry, and graduated at the end of 2019. So, Oh, awesome. Yeah. Do you feel like, cause it's one thing me as like a someone trying to interpret the research and then apply it to my clients and like use that data. Is is there a difference you feel between someone like how I might look at it and how do you look at it differently? Do you feel like, do you feel like you've got a, a different perspective because you were more heavily involved with it? Has it, do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think I got to see kind of the populations we deal with in a research setting and then comparing to, okay, is this, the exact same kind of person that I deal with, who's maybe someone getting ready to go, go on stage, like that level of a, a trained, you know, athlete. Cause I think we read research and we see, oh, they were trained, but you don't realize that sometimes 
they're trained, but maybe not to the degree that, that when we say, you know, you and I talk about someone's a trained individual, like this might be someone that's really like just learning to do an overhead press properly, for example, or hasn't, you know, done, you know, every, you know, movement pattern. So it, it kind of gave me kind of that perspective of like what really goes on in research and to kind of look at research and interpret more critically um, and kind of use it as a guide while also looking at the individual in front of me. Absolutely. No, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. And in regards to diet breaks and refeeds specifically, in your own practice as a coach and as a competitor, are they things you personally incorporate? I know, I, th- I feel like Bill is more on the side of, they. there's more going on than just a psychological thing. He, at least that's that's the the feeling I get from him when he talks through them, whereas other people are like, they're just psychological, like you don't quote unquote need them. Of course, we don't need them. But how, what's been your experience uh, with those? Because it's always interesting because I think different lots of coaches have different perspectives and we all have our own experience as well. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really fun debate because I think there's a lot that we still don't know. I think I think I'm with Dr. Campbell in that I think there's both a benefit um, physiologically potentially and then psychologically. I think some of those physiological benefits might be more so for someone like contest prep, like when we're talking about we're talking about like that those little one percent half a percent differences or or benefits that really could make or break someone or affect you know their placing on stage. So I think you know from the physiological perspective, probably more so benefit the leaner someone is, but psychologically, like across the board, you know, going to benefit people. And I I don't tend to pre-plan diet breaks or refeeds. I usually just go off the client's biofeedback. However, I will pre-plan if someone's got, you know, lifestyle athlete, like vacations or, you know, work event, you know, whatever the case might be. I even do things like, you know, and I'm sure you do this as well, like a four day refeed, I guess you could call it a mini diet break. Like there's kind of no, I don't really have like a set way of doing things. Like, and that's, I think in the research, people think, oh, you have to have the back-to-back refeed or you have to have the full week diet break. It's like, well, no, you could have, you know, a 10 day diet break, or you could do, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be so so textbook and so rigid. Yeah, I think it. Was, this just makes me think of. Uh, I think it was Mike Zordos talked about. He obviously did a lot on DUP, and he said something right. along the lines of, "I found we've stumbled across the best DUP to date, but that doesn't mean there's going to be something better." And it's like you said there, like back to back refeeds. They've been researched and they seem to be like decent evidence behind them, but we haven't like done every single <laughs> different kind of refeed under the sun. I don't know. Even people talk about like protein refeed so they just bring up calories through protein for example it's like oh like that hasn't been studied but it's interesting i'm sure people have their own experiences with it but i would agree with contest prep it i've done contest preps uh, well only one without refeeds completely and mm-hmm. i did use diet breaks and then in my most recent one i personally used uh, refeeds and i found them to be really helpful and it seems to be like some I, I have found some clients are just like I've done refeeds before they really help and in those cases it's like if you don't give them a refeed it's almost like traumatizing for them so they definitely do better with them and then there's other people who are just I don't know you get that person who's just like if you give me a, like an inch I'll take a mile and you, you can't go that route I, I was just gonna say that too yeah I mean like there are people that you know and this is one area where my coaching I think has changed a little bit over the years is I'm not afraid to get a little, a little more aggressive with someone and just be, you know, seven days a week, you know, same game plan and just get in, get out and be done with it. Um, and that kind of helps keep them more on track. So you, again, back to that, that psychology piece. And I like that you're not kind of just, I guess, really prescriptive with it. It's like we start prep and it's two a week and then we go to like four a week. It's a case of, she let's listen to how the client's getting on, how they're progressing, if they're doing really well without it or whatever we're not going to incorporate it or maybe there's different signs because I think everyone wants the easy answer. They want like refeeds that that you have to use, like for the best results, you need to use them. They want a like black and white answer, but it's not always that way. You mentioned some biofeedback kind of that you're looking for for clients. I think people would be interested to hear kind of what, what sort of signs are you looking for to uh, start incorporating those? Yeah, for sure. So I'm, you'll hear me say that a lot, like biofeedback. And I think the first time I mentioned it to someone like outside of like, you know, the coaching setting, like a family member, they're like, what is this device that you're, you know, (laughs) biofeedback, like tracker? I was like, no, it's just like, like, how is your sleep? 
how is your digestion? You know, how is your energy levels? You're, you know, are you getting a pump in the gym? Um, females like menstrual cycle, like symptoms related to that. So it's all of the signs and, and symptoms that your body is presenting. I mean, there's a lot of data that your body's giving you that you don't need a watch to track or a ring, like that stuff's cool. And yes, I do. If someone has like an aura ring, for example, like I'll have them maybe report their HRV, but, um, yeah, I use like all that, you know, kind of biofeedback, all that kind of data to kind of, to make a decision. So, um, and also just there, you know, I guess this isn't, this is more kind of subjective, but how, how, how are they sending the check-in to me? Like what is kind of the verbiage or the tone of, of their check-in? Because we can tell a lot from that as a coach, like we can tell when someone's maybe getting a little more stressed and, you know, then we kind of notice, oh, sleep was kind of poor a couple nights, you know, they rated stress as an eight out of a 10, a couple days this week, um, you know, hunger's picking up. Maybe this is a sign that maybe I give them, you know, a refeed or a diet break and maybe we haven't stalled out yet, or maybe they're not, you know, in that, to that point of desperation, but I'm going to get ahead of it yeah. and incorporate this before they snowball. Yeah. I think it's that's a really smart move it's like i don't know people who don't want to deload and they just get injured <laughs> it's like you have it you want to use these tools before like a binge happens or something uh something right. along those lines because yeah that's that's never a nice thing and yeah i like the the kind of biofeedback as well it sounds i think it can almost sound a little bit like the biohackers and so mm -hmm. i think it's like that sort of term but i think the things you mentioned there a lot of the listeners are just like absolutely and unlike the biohackers who i think probably do really favor the tech and like the aura rings and things and i have like you, i don't know if you've been there sarah but i've definitely eyed them up being like oh, do i do i want this extra tool like we love investing in our sport like every percent counts but I, I have very much the same perspective as you as like is it worth the stress of like looking at all these things or can you like wake up in the morning and be like am i well rested or do i need a coffee right now and aspects like that you can always get the feedback you need if you listen to your body rather than being like i don't know what's my hrv oh i i'm certainly not ready to train today and it's like well how do you actually feel? Like, could you just go in and kind of do yeah. your session or not? I know you've had a, a couple of guests on the, on the show to talk about that, but that's something I'm, I'm big on. Like people, I see people get obsessive about it or, yeah. Oh, but my aura said that I can train. And I'm like, you know, I, you need this rest day today. Like, you know, I, I know you do. Yeah, the but, other way. I didn't think about it that yeah. way. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm kind of like, cause, and I think it's impactful to coach someone and, and teach them to recognize that by biofeedback in themselves, because, you know, especially with, you know, our lifestyle athletes, like I'm not expecting them to have a coach forever. And I want them to be able to kind of do this on their own yeah. and, and knowing how to interpret and recognize that feedback that their body's giving them is really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I kind of jumped the gun there. I, I did actually want to dig into your background a little bit, which we did start about. Uh, but I wanted to dig into like what initially led you to study uh, exercise science and also what got you into competing specifically in the bikini class. Yeah. So, wow, I guess. So I've always been, I always knew I wanted to get into the health field, you know, in some capacity. I was actually on the nursing track for a long time. And a lot of my own interest in health and, and whatnot comes from my own background. So I grew up, you know, athletic, you know, I was never like elite athlete, but, you know, played basketball, played, ran track, horseback riding. And I did, I developed an eating disorder, uh, anorexia when I was 14 years old. Yeah. 14 years old and struggled with that on and off for, for a lot of years up until I was about like 21, I would say. Um, and, you know, as I, you know, got to college and was still, still kind of struggling off and on, but that's where I, you know, kind of got into weight training a little bit because I was, I was starting to recover and I had to get away from the running. Like that was just becoming too much of a trigger for me and, and the eating disorder kind of tendencies. So learning, you know, strength training and training to be strong was like a really helpful shift for me. Um, and, you know, as I kind of started to get into it and was, you know, online, like researching, like trying to figure out how to put together a program and stuff, I would stumble upon, I think the website was um, simply shredded or something like that and bodybuilding.com. And I would read these interviews from some of these 
female uh, competitors and fitness models. And I would read their programming and see like, oh, wow, they're squatting and they're eating carbohydrates. Like these were actually, I, I, I was lucky to kind of stumble upon some decent, I think, interviews and decent programs and reading like, oh, wow, these women like look like that. And she weighs 30 pounds more than I do. Like, wow, like I'm going to have to gain a lot of weight and lift heavy and do this for a lot of time to even to look like that. And, you know, this is a possibility for me. So that was kind of like how I got into kind of the bodybuilding side of things. And then, um, like I said, I was kind of on the nursing track in school and I took a weight training class as like an elective in college. And I thought it was just going to be like, oh, you just show up at the rec center and kind of get to do what you want. And it's a free for all. And I, it was a little different than that. And I was introduced to one of the graduate students in the program, in the exercise science program. Um, and, you know, got friendly with her, Lauren, and she introduced me to Dr. Campbell. And he, you know, gave me his spiel and kind of gave me an idea of what I could do, you know, going that route career wise. And that's kind of where I, I made the switch um, and decided to kind of kind of go it all in on that. And really, you know, I, education was a really big part of my recovery from anorexia, like learning the value of food beyond calories. And, oh, wow, if you're the athlete you say you want to be, you need these carbohydrates to fuel that performance and things of that nature. So I think that's where I felt really pulled toward furthering my education so that I could deliver the best coaching, but then also the have the best, you know, backing behind that coaching to my clients, you know, in the future. Absolutely. Uh, no, that's, that's really cool how it's just like, it's almost the people you meet and they influence you. And it's just like, I don't know if you didn't go and do that weight training session, like what, what would have happened? Uh, where would life have taken you? And uh, out of interest, how, I know you, do you just, I think actually you coach one-on-one -on -one and you're on line, right? Is that what you have been doing full-time for quite a while now? Yeah. So I mostly coach online. Um, my, actually my first coaching job was in person. It was at like a, a local meal prep company and I did nutrition coaching in person, ah. uh, for a, a little under a year. And then I switched to online. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been online and I have a couple in-person training clients that I, that I see. Um, I have a, a gym around here that I'm lucky to pop into to train in person at, but mostly online. Hey, Pascal here. I just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching. And if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level, hit the link in the description below. And then in terms of, uh, obviously, you've competed. I, I don't know if you've done multiple seasons, but you have certainly, at least I've seen like photos of you've competed in bikini before. Were there any... Did other people have concerns and did you have concerns when you were thinking to take it to stage? Because I assume there was fat loss involved and obviously that's kind of, well, bodybuilding inherently is kind of hyper-focused on nutrition, but you talked about kind of all the like, you know, you have to fuel for performance and things like this. Whereas when you diet down, it's a kind of a little bit of a different story. You start getting hyper-focused on how you look in the mirror and those sort of things. How, how was that for you? Yeah. So I competed in 2019. I guess I glossed over that originally. Um, I've been in, in a improvement season ever since, but yeah, in 2019, I, you know, I was having the conversation with my coach. I was like, do you think I have enough muscle? And, you know, da, da, da. and he's like, you know, like, like, do I think you have enough muscle to go pro? Like, no, like we both know that, but, uh, you know, on the other side of the coin, like, what if you, you know, you keep waiting and building and, you know, digging in this improvement season and you finally get on stage and you find out you hate it. Like, you know, and then we, you spent all that time. So, you know, he was like, let's just, you know, let's prep, let's do it. So I, I did uh, compete in 2019 and my feedback was, yeah, too small, got to grow. So that's what I've been doing ever since. But yeah, leading up to that, that was a big thing. And, you know, at the time I was, you know, still seeing a therapist pretty regularly. I have a lot of support systems, you know, in my recovery, my husband, friends, and I was really honest with, you know, all of them and, and really broke it down, like kind of my intentions with competing and was this, you know, eating disorder related. And for me, it, it absolutely was not. It was more so I love this lifestyle of bodybuilding and this is kind of the next step and I want to see what I can do. 
And I was very honest with them about, you know, potentially what maybe my triggers would be. And I knew that the big issue for me potentially would come up at the end of it when I was, it was time to gain weight and start reversing out of it. So, you know, I was honest with my coach, honest again with my support systems. And I actually found like at the end of, at the end of my prep, you know, after I stepped off stage, I was like, I was ready to gain weight. Like I was like, I do not like how I look. Like I know I don't look strong. I'm ready to gain weight. So it wasn't as much of a, a struggle as I think I prepared myself for it to potentially be. And I think that was a sign for me that I really was in a good spot with my recovery. Uh, my parents definitely were very concerned though. I, I and bet. you know, and with that, you know, I explained, you know, kind of the, my why, but at the end of the day, I think, actions have to speak louder than words when, and, and of course they were concerned, you know, they saw me go through, um, the in and out of treatment centers, but, you know, I think me showing them that, no, I really was living this lifestyle in a healthy way and did, you know, gain the weight. I mean, I've gained 30 pounds since then. And, you know, definitely a body fat, but also a good bit of muscle. But I think that them just seeing that, you know, kind of showed to them that I am, you know, in on this different other side of it. Yeah. I initially wanted to just reflect on the kind of mention of, because I think there'll be listeners here who are thinking about competing themselves and they probably were similar to you and, or they could have been similar in that thought process of art. Oh, like I'm not big enough yet. I'll put it off. I'll put it off. But I think it's like you mentioned, once you've got some muscle mass, sure, you don't need to, like you're not competing. Not, I hope most people aren't competing just to, for the trophy or to go pro. They're also doing it for the whole journey to stage for whatever reason that why is. And I like the the thought process. Like like you said, you might have invested like I don't know a decade of training and being rigid with everything. In, you're doing it for this goal of competing, and then you do it, and you're like, I hate that. And it's like I wish I could get get all that time back. Whereas now you've learned, oh, now this investment is worth it. Like I'm excited to do future seasons and future shows. So I really like that. Uh, and then you're actually it's hearing you talk through kind of competing it. Not that my why for competing initially was to kind of prove to myself I was over my um, kind of ill health that I had had previously and kind of to go through that kind of sense of relief was like oh I can I'm like my body is healthy it's responding in the right way and not that you did it for that reason but I imagine that's like the ultimate proof that you are over your disorder from the past is like you're eager to put on weight you are putting on weight it's like now you feel even more confident in doing future seasons as well Absolutely. Yeah. For me, this sport really is kind of looking, you know, old kind of demons head on and being like, nope, like I'm going to do the opposite of that. You know, I'm going to take up space. And I know other people may not see it that way, but only, you know, your intentions. And I think someone, someone with a background like myself, like you can take it out in any way. Like it could come out as, you know, alcohol, you know, addiction, you know, addiction, gambling, you know, you could channel that inner inner traits in any negative way or you can uh, channel them in a positive way so that's kind of what what bodybuilding is for me and i guess on the nutritional front it, it's something i see somewhat regularly is more so with females who compete and then they kind of like completely stop and they maybe even if they're in the fitness industry go down the route of almost like almost like anti-diet and they kind of uh, like they, they go I, I just have seen this cycle with a number of people how do you balance that because I imagine it seems like you've seen it as well and you you're obviously not anti-diet but you kind of keep a, a healthy approach to it and why do you think these people are going through that kind of like really extreme into it and then almost extreme the other way yeah I think it's they got kind of burned by it a little bit. I think they had a negative experience or had a negative experience coming out of it and maybe weren't supported or didn't have the right tools or just maybe like in the diet itself, like didn't have, you know, cause we know bodybuilding and prepping isn't healthy, but there's a healthier way to go about it. So maybe they didn't have that experience or mentally weren't in the best spot to begin with and didn't have the best, you know, kind of outlook towards things. So I think like, I mean, you see that with like people demonize like macro tracking and say it's inherently, you know, disordered and it absolutely can be, but it's all, it's not the tool. It's, it's how you use it. And I think kind of the same with dieting. Cause I do, I think I do struggle with that a little bit because, you know, I talk a lot about 
not dieting and spending time out of, you know, a deficit and building muscle, but then I will, you know, show a client who's dieted and been successful and lost, you know, body fat. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, there's a time and a place and being intentional about it. And like I was saying before, kind of getting in and getting out and not, not lingering there, um, I think is, you know, important. So I think just in general, our industry tends to be very black and white, kind of how we were saying before, but yeah, yeah, you can, you can, I think you can have it all. Yeah. I think that's uh, well said. It's, I mean, having that kind of education, having a good coach in your corner, doing it very responsibly, realizing it's an extreme sport. So I think a lot of people do unfortunately get into it and they, I don't know, don't know the, any wiser. And maybe, uh, unfortunately, in the in the past more so, maybe a lot of the coaches who were available were males. They treat their females like males, push them into the dirt, which is fine. A guy's going to, most guys are going to be able to recover from that, but the females aren't quite the same when you push them to that extreme and like problems can ensue. So maybe it's partly related to that. But I think you said like knowing why you're you're doing it like fat loss gets demonized but i think it's demonized when it's a case of someone thinks fat loss is the answer to making them happy and it's like i don't know they're looking at it for the the wrong reason but it could be part of what makes them happy they could feel healthier fitter they can kind of run around more be with their kids or whatever live longer potentially these sort of aspects so uh, yeah I, I love that mentality but you did mention about kind of uh, encouraging people not to diet all the time which i think is a great thing in terms of specifically maybe women, but also just people you've coached and in your experience, what do you think is kind of holding people back building the physique that they want to build? I think a lot of times when they do enter that reverse diet or a building phase, they still have one foot in the diet. Like they still have that idea of like, okay, well, when can I diet again? Like, when can I like, you know, when is this phase over? Like, when can we cut again? It's like, well, what if you, what if we just built to build like what if we just were building muscle not with it the thought in the back of our mind of oh I'm doing this so I can diet like what if we like went all in on this phase and really put our focus on the training because I think what people don't maybe realize sometimes especially women is that it's the training that's going to be the big stimulus to change and and create that physique I mean if it was just the food like if it was just about eating more like we wouldn't have an obesity issue, right? Like everyone would be jacked. Like, it, so it's that time in the gym and training. And I think that's, I think that's an issue I see a lot with clients is still like having certain, like doing certain things, like, like the volume eating, I see that a lot or not wanting to take rest days um, and just not mentally being all in on the growth that kind of holds people back. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, the, the, I like the thought of like, they've always got one foot like left in the diet. They never fully leave it and they don't embrace the complete gaining phase. And like you said, I always talk about training being like, training is the match that lights the fire for muscle gain. Like the fuel is just like the nutrition. It's just permissive of whatever you're doing. If you're not providing that kind of ignition, you're just <laughs> like, it's not going to go well, but you have to also invest it. Like it's a really slow process. Whereas I guess uh, people are used to potentially being like, I don't know, I cut for four weeks, so I mass for four weeks, right? So then I get back to cutting again. Yeah. Uh, and people lose discipline in those massing phases and things like this as well. Uh, in terms of training for females, uh, again, specifically, uh, assuming you mostly work with females, I'm not sure you might work with uh, a lot of men as well. I have, but... a good, I have like just two or three guys, but yeah, mostly yeah. females. What do you find maybe some of the things they were doing wrong that you kind of incorporate and help them with to get better. And then maybe some of the key differences you find between your male and female clients, if any. Yeah. So I think I was actually talking about this on another podcast the other day. I think a lot of women think they're training hard, but they don't realize that tr like just moving around until you're exhausted isn't the same thing as hard, effective sets. So showing them that, hey, you can lift heavier and you, you're you stronger than you think um, and getting them to change their training structure from being so high volume and just exhaustive to effective and intentional in, you know, the, you know, both exercises they select and, you know, the loads that they choose, the tempo that they execute those movements with. Um, I'm really big on like training videos and having my clients send me 
um, you know, training videos in their check-ins because that's where I can see like, you know, what they're actually doing. Um, that's a big like disconnect. Like, you know, a couple of years ago, I didn't do that, but you know, every once in a while I'd ask a client to send me a video and I would get it and I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, oh wow. Like we're far off, you know, from what I thought or what I had envisioned that you were doing. So yeah, that's kind of why we're not getting, you know, the results as quickly. Um, so I think, did that answer your question with on that? Yeah. I think for like the, some of you, uh, I see it the same actually, even with a lot of the guys that come to us, uh, like stripping back volume, working on quality and maybe not so much, but it makes sense that some people have the idea of just like, I need to leave the gym, like exhausted, but not like locally exhausted in muscles, just like physically, just like completely, or maybe classic cardiovascularly exhausted. And they kind of associate that with something positive. So yeah, that definitely answers the question. And I love that you are particular about getting form videos uh, from your clients, because I think as a online coach, who's like prescribing someone, maybe you're prescribing them to go to close to failure. You should be probably for like hypertrophy, like you need to make sure they're doing it in a safe, productive manner. Do you ever get like people who don't want to film videos like is there any way you find that you can help encourage that and like you yeah help them realize the importance yeah i i do get like not direct pushback but like you know people some people send me a lot of videos and some people you know it's they don't so um i just you know continue to mention it and hey like ultimately it's you know it's their their results you know and i like in this day and age i don't know about your gym but everyone in my gym's filming like so i think it's a lot a lot less taboo. And I'll usually say like, Hey, like, you know, I don't need you to send me every exercise, but like, you know, when the gym's, you know, quieter, or, you know, go in a corner, whatever it is, send me, you know, take a, you know, set up your phone, put it against your, your shaker cup and, you know, take a, take a video. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it's kind of, I think on them to, they know why I'm asking for it. And that's, I mean, if you go to a coach, you're looking to improve, I would hope. So being a little vulnerable is kind of what it takes sometimes in order to do that. Um, I would say like my male clients, though, like I see the same thing. It's, I think it's across the board. A lot of people just doing more volume and more stuff and less effective stuff. I think that the males tend to be less heady um, than some of the females. And, you know, you kind of give them the plan and it's like, oh, okay, coach, like, let's give this a go. Um, and some of the females tend to kind of get in that, like kind of overthinking pattern, um, which I relate to personally. And I think that yeah. overthinking held me back for a long time. Um, but maybe, I mean, maybe that's just my kind of little pool of people to kind of observe, but that's kind of some of the observations I've seen. Yeah. Mine's, mine's a little bit mixed. Um, <laughs> but I have had, uh, I guess one of my experiences with the number of women I've worked with is like, sometimes they're very used to having these, I, I would call them almost like fluff glute exercises where it's lots, lots of cable work and things like this. Whereas I'm like, I've got them doing the RD. They're like, where's all my glute work? And I'm like, we've got like <laughs> loads of squats, lunges, like hip hinges, like we've got hip thrusts in there. And they're like, oh, and like I explained, there's like so much sets. Do you, yeah. do you find that as well? Do you, and what's your philosophy? Because maybe you like some of these other exercises as well, but... Yeah. Like where's my like frog pumps and I don't know, like, like I just, I'm not, I'm about, I'm about the basics. You know, I do, I'll do program kickbacks, like cable kickbacks, but they're not my bread and butter uh, with people. You know, I'm with you like squats, RDLs, lunges. I just think a lot of movement movements that you see on social media, it's just, it's just kind of gimmicky. It's just, yeah. Oh, this is novel. This is new. And kind of on that, I, I overheard a conversation at the gym one time. I had, I forgot my headphones that day and there was one girl, you know, showing, you know, her friends, I, I don't even know what to call it, Steve. I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> like I couldn't, I couldn't name what they were doing, but it was some thrusting glute thing. And she was showing her friend what you're supposed to do. And she, they were following this program. And the friend was like, do I really have to do that? That's so embarrassing. Like, are you sure? <laughs> and the other friend's like, yeah, come on, we got to do it. And I'm like, this poor girl is so embarrassed to do this extra thrusty exercise when like, no, there are like six other exercises that you could do that would be more effective and that you could overload. Um, Cause I think that's the issue too. And a lot of women don't realize that is like, you're like, you, you can't, you know, do nothing like, bands and body weight and 
progress on that uh over time yeah no absolutely yeah it's the yeah the band like you said it it's a people i think use social media inappropriately sometimes as like almost like a, an exercise library of sorts and they're just like pick and choose i'll oh, make a workout out of this this influence is doing this oh i guess um and some people are doing like good workouts they're putting their workout up and they're like this is my session and some of them are very like structured but a lot of them are just like excess volume loads of fluff in there like not effective workout so yeah unfortunately those get very popular as well and i guess it's sometimes easier and it's very like very effective like hypertrophy style training is really uncomfortable and uh, people when it's new to you it's like you 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 are putting your muscle into a position of discomfort and to maintain technique through that discomfort is really like it's horrible it's like it's not a nice experience like we enjoy right. it but when you're new to all of that like i can see why these other like it's like anything like this easy people want the easy route and they think oh if that's going to equal the same results as that i'm going to do this over here and they just have to get burnt enough times to realize actually the effective stuff is like it's the hard stuff that i have to go back to exactly yeah uh so uh obviously one of the questions i had actually was the difference between males and females if you have found any if you have seen any kind of differences between when you train your male and female clients I would say, I'm trying to think. I think I said like the females tend to be less in, or more in their head. I think than than oh, the okay. guys do. Um, I think definitely the females, though. I mean, we would see this in the lab too. Even are definitely more like precise sometimes, like with with check ins, and um, they. I don't know. They tend to. The, they communicate differently. I wouldn't say one is better or, you know, different. And it depends on the male too. Cause like I've had males that like give me all the data and like give me all the feedback. And then I have some that it's like, it's pulling teeth. So, and I think also, I don't know, I think it's different me being a female coach yeah, versus if I was a male coach, you know, kind of working with both. Um, but I, I, I think women, you do tend to have to like push more to add you know, load to the bar and then guys, it's more like, Oh no, let's strip it back a little bit. Um, I think, I think that's definitely a common theme. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service at revive stronger. We pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. I guess then the, uh, the, the, the thing I was like pursuing and it, it, you kind of answered it by not uh, mentioning it was like, there's no inherent training differences. Like the principles for male muscle growth equally apply to like females. Oh, yeah. and there's no major differences in that. Yeah. Regard. I think oh that, that I think that bothers me just seeing like all the, like, yes, like females are different than men. And like you were saying earlier, like we can't diet exactly the same, but we're not that magically different. I don't think. And I think there's a lot of, just marketing around like, oh, the female program or, you know, cycle syncing and things like that. And I'm just, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a, a fan. I'm back to like, you know, if we're talking about like cycle syncing and working with someone's menstrual cycle, I'm like, let's work with the individual again and based off their own biofeedback. I, I that's actually a question I was going to come on to was, uh, cause I know you'd spoken about it and I was really interested to see that that was your perspective because, um, like I do, I see it being like people who are talking about the menstrual cycle then almost use it as like a selling point like oh you should track because you should periodize exactly with your period and in the luteal phase you have to be doing this with your training and nutrition and like exactly mapping it out kind of like we talked about like that perfect like you have to refeed two times a week and like next week like in a month's time it's three and like it's like you're just following like a basic program and you're not thinking or taking the individual into consideration so yeah definitely like what's been your experience with like the individual differences between females because you probably work with a lot more than me but I even have like because of your comments that I was like that's how I feel <laughs> yeah no I mean that, like what you were saying before like oh do this in the luteal phase like that just sounds like such a headache to me and like <laughs> yeah. this as an athlete, like if my coach made me do that I would be like are you kidding like because <laughs> I mean yes I do see that some females are you know a little bit weaker you know around like the week before their menstrual cycle or the week of but then I see others that aren't affected at all, or it's actually the week after their menstrual cycle that they, you know, notice weight is up and 
energy is down a little bit and it's just really, you know, client specific. So I encourage my clients to track their menstrual cycle because I think it's a important biofeedback marker that can tell us a lot about, about their health. And we can use that marker to kind of, you know, as, as just one marker of many, uh, to dictate maybe like, maybe like you notice your resting heart rates, you know, elevated and you know, like based off tracking that you're coming up on your cycle, your menstrual cycle. So like, maybe we know, and you go to the gym and then you feel like, you know, kind of punky. We know that maybe your, your RPE eight that day, isn't going to be your RPE eight from last week load wise, but you can still bring an RPE eight. You can still bring whatever intensity you have. So I just think that, I think that the cycle syncing and I think just using, I think the messaging sometimes makes it almost so that your menstrual cycle is debilitating or it's, you, you should be weaker and it's this kind of messaging. And I don't think that's helpful. And I think if someone's menstrual cycle is that debilitating, well, then maybe we need to go see the doctor and get some lab work done and kind of dig into maybe why it's so debilitating. Yeah, I think that's that's really well said because I think it is a case of, I don't know, it's you're doing, maybe you're doing an exercise and it feels amazing, but then you see someone else who's like an expert, they say, oh, you should be doing it this way. And you're like, oh, I should be doing it that way. Like you just discount completely your personal experience in the matter. Same with like, you you might be one of those women, like you said, who's not affected by it, but because this expert or what have you, or someone's kind of saying, oh, you need to size, like sync it with that. You're like, I'm backing off this week, but I feel super strong. This feels really weird. It's like right, uh, th- yeah. this kind of biofeedback that you've been talking about, and like, I guess using that to auto-regulate. I think that's once you understand how to kind of apply it, and it's not that complicated, but I guess going through a coaching experience makes it far easier. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, for contest prep specific, I think, I mean, the fact that you've talked about tracking your menstrual cycle, I think is great because I think there is, I, I'm surprised by how many women I end up working with who don't really know and then they're not tracking it at the time because it's kind of as a male it's new to me and i'm like oh we should be tracking this like it's it can be valuable data that's going to impact things do you find um when you are taking females through prep that it's individual again if people lose it or don't lose it and what do you find leads to that and how do you go about kind of regaining it if if that does occur yeah, I would say it's individual. I would say most of the time we do lose it those last, you know, three, two, three months, you know, of, of prep. It, I mean, again, it depends, but I have had clients that get stage lean and have their menstrual cycle all the way up and never lose it at all. So I think it's just kind of, I think that part is, is individual, you know, specific. I think every person has their individual fresh threshold for stress and some bodies are just, you know, more resilient than others and they're going to keep fighting to stay fertile no matter what. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think that's just how they're, how they're made up, you know, their genetics, but, um, I would say it's, it's more common than not to lose someone's cycle. And again, like we said, like, is that great? Maybe not, but that's the sport. And we know we have an exit plan and, you know, a plan to reverse out of this. And that's, that's, you know, game plan post-show is I'm more of that, and that I, and I used to be more in the reverse. And I, again, if we have to pick a camp, the reverse diet versus recovery diet, you know, I know you've, you've talked about that. And in the past, I used to be more on that kind of slower approach, but now I'm more so like, no, like let's, you know, bump you up, you know, 300, 400 calories off the bat. And then, you know, kind of reverse from there in order to get healthy sooner than later. Um, so usually like, you know, I like to give someone, you know, a month or so like a solid like two months post show before we like even like expect the menstrual cycle back if it if it le- if it left if it if it stopped um and kind of see what the body's going to do on its own before i start having them freak out over blood work or supplements or anything like that because i think that stress is more harm than good sometimes like i think sometimes you see coaches it's like okay we have to get the cycle back and it's like well let's give the body a chance to kind of do its thing. Like, especially if someone was regular before, um, you know, we let's give it some time to kind of normalize and, you know, start feeding them up, start pulling back cardio and kind of see what happens. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's really well said, especially like give it time because yeah, people think like, I don't know, they feel like if they've gained a certain amount of body fat back, they've been on a certain number of calories, like they should be feeling normal. But I mean, time is like heals all. Uh, and sometimes you just, especially if you've been on like a six month prep, it's going to take a while to recover that back. Yeah. Do you find, um, do you ever get females coming to you for contest prep or dieting and they haven't got their menstrual cycle and or others maybe they've got their menstrual cycle but you maybe have to turn them down for a contest prep have you found that that's something you've had to do and, yeah, and why why that. would you if, if that is something you do <laughs> yeah so i mean if someone doesn't have if someone doesn't have their menstrual cycle and they're like you know pre like they're you know younger like they're not perimenopausal or in menopause then yeah, like that's kind of a red flag to me that, Hey, like this is an important marker of health. Like ovulating is a really important thing that your body does to create progesterone and, you know, be healthy. And if we, if we're not ovulating, if we're not having a cycle, your fat loss is going to be kind of suboptimal anyway. Um, and we potentially could be digging you in a, a deeper hole. So that's where I'm going to say like, and, and looking at where, you know, they're currently maintaining, like a lot of times in those cases, someone's maybe maintaining on a lower amount of calories, maybe they're doing a lot of cardio, maybe they're really low body fat. And I'll say like, hey, like, actually, I think we need to kind of reverse diet, you know, maybe you need to go get some lab work done, you know, check in with your doctor. Um, and I mean, other things too, like if someone comes to me and they like, only poop once a week or, you know, they like have like all these other things going on. We say, Hey, this is not the best time to start a prep or a diet, you know, at all. Like we need to be working on your health first and really driving home that internal health precedes all physique changes. Like it's got to start there because otherwise it's, it's going to be a fight and just not the end result that you're really hoping for. Yeah. I think that's, that's really well said. Uh, I guess an analogy it makes me think of is, I don't know, starting up a race with a beat up car or half a tank of fuel it's like you, it's just not going to be an efficient race you probably won't get to the end and you're just going to make the whole situation worse so uh, i think it's just important for people to hear like that you like you need to be in a really healthy place to start what is a really extreme adventure otherwise yeah you might just end up starting and not finishing or if you do finish it's not going to be pretty come out the other side and Maybe you'll end up like some of, like we talked about those women who end up going down like the anti-diet route because it's like, oh, that broke me. So now like I'm going against this. So it's it's great that there's people like yourself, Sarah, out there like sharing this message and not just, unfortunately, I think some people just want the client, want the money and they're like, oh, let's do what they want. And yeah. it's unfortunately I mean, yeah, kind of Unfortunately, like I've lost clients or lost leads, you know, because of it yeah. and like it sucks, but you know, at the end of the day, like I, I just... I won't have that on me. Yeah. Fantastic. And then for yourself, Sarah, personally, do you have like a, are you still gunning for bikini? Do you have a season in mind? What are your kind of like short and long-term kind of personal goals? Yeah. So I am, I'm hoping next year by next year, you know, I'll be, you know, on stage again or, you know, prepping. Uh, I, I'm really leaving it up to my coach though. Honestly, like I'm like, you got my timeline. Cause I think I, you know, kind of mentioned before I used to be kind of overthinking like on the timelines and right now like I don't want now that I've competed once like I don't want to do it again and go through all that and invest the time and money unless I'm going to be competitive enough to you know have like an overall at least on like a regional level, level winning winning physique my goal for my next season would be to make it to a national stage and be competitive there so um so yeah, I mean, and bikini will be my division. I mean, I would love to grow to figure, but it's just not, it's you know, in my, in my cards naturally. I mean, even, even enhanced, I don't know if my body would have the, those capabilities to healthily put on that much muscle mass, at least it, for the next season in the next you know three years, even. So, um, yeah, I've just been growing and I'm happy doing so. Like, I really like people sell, tell, ask, you know, when's the next show? And it's like, when I'm ready, like whenever that is, and that's okay. Yeah. I always, I don't know who, where I heard it from. It might've been like, so it's probably Jeff Alberts. That's what I'm going to put it to is like the stage is always there. Like it's not going to suddenly disappear next year or unless like something like uh, COVID happens and we yeah. can't compete, but I mean, it's going to be there the year after hopefully. So um, that I think that's a great kind of also guiding line is like, especially now you've got, once you have got that experience of like that 
one time you're like i know i want to do it again but i'll do it when like i'm set up and ready and i'm in a place where i'm going to achieve some of the expectations that i have for myself so i think that that makes a lot of sense uh and then with your like personal business and everything is that you still looking to like do you have any goals in terms of that or any visions like what's your your personal goals in that regard yeah i think that's i mean that's one of the great things about the off season too is more time for those kind of life gains yeah. right? and that's that's what I'm really focusing on right now is just continuing to you know better serve my clients and grow my business that way is continuing my own education you know I, I work with a mentor you know I go to a, as many like in-person events take courses when I can um, and just continuing to expand my own knowledge to help my clients and I'm getting to that point now too where I'm getting a lot of clients from referrals and that that always feels good to know like yeah. hey like you know, you're bringing your friend to work with me because, you know, I helped you get to where you want to be or improve, you know, in some way, shape or form. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where my intention is right now is continuing to, to grow there. You know, you're doing a good job when a client is, if, if a client comes back, you know, that's a very good sign. And also if they're referring other people to you, that's also yeah. a, a very good sign. And then in regards to actually just like to flip back to contest prep, what's the thing you find hardest when you're dieting for a show? Ooh, for me, I would say the actual like dieting wasn't hard. Um, I would say it was, it's more so like the energy and like once like, like mentally, like once you have to like start like, like working extra hard to stay focused and like, you know, go, going to the mailbox feels like a chore and folding yeah. the laundry and all that. Like, that's like the hard part is like, I'll have the energy for my cardio and my training and work, but you know, those little things, it's like, oh man, that that's, that becomes a chore. So I, I think, um, it'll be interesting my next, you know, prep, because when I prepped last time I was in grad school, you know, working, you know, part-time and it'll be, you know, different, you know, next time. So it'll be kind of interesting to see. Um, I kind of want to want to keep it under wraps whenever I do prep next time. And, you know, like kind of keep it a secret for a little bit. And then, you know, kind of reveal maybe 10 weeks, eight weeks out or whatever, that this is what I'm doing. Um, and kind of see how far I can get away with like, you know, staying normal without other people noticing it. I, I like that approach. I think I probably suck at it though, because for me, at least one, I love sharing it on social media and I can't help myself, but also with my girlfriend, like she's the person who I just tell, like if, if I can't keep stuff to myself, I'll be telling her stuff. And she's like, why are you even telling me this? This is like, I don't need to know. I'm just like, I just need to say it. Just, just need to say it. So I'm unfortunately yeah. a bit selfish with, well, with that. Yeah, I think I'd I, like I, to hide I should, it. <laughs> I should say like, keep it a secret to select people. Cause I'm kind of <laughs> the same way. Like, yeah, my best friends, like my husband, like, you know, I probably can't hide it from everyone absolutely awesome so yeah this has been a great chat i think and hopefully people have got some key takeaways from this and obviously wow. like just the differences with males and females and how they're maybe not that different but uh, and how to approach training and nutrition for them and if they really want to grow then they've got to accept like they need to invest in that phase like you have for so long a prime example of that if people want to learn more about we obviously mentioned your podcast um, and if people are interested in coaching with yourself where should they head yeah. So my, my Instagram is where I'm most active. So it's at Sarah Ford Bishop and I got the link in the link tree, like everyone else. And you can apply to work with me um, through there. Awesome. And I guess, well, if they want to keep up with your off season, they can. And if they want to know when you're eight or six weeks out, they, yeah. they have to keep up with your Instagram and they'll, they'll find that out as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Sarah. Uh, it's been great chatting and uh, guys, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. 
So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.